Sorry, assholes, your quiet day at the office is about to get severely fucked up. Guys, welcome back to the After Action Review. You know me, I'm Nick Guy, the world's most okay Green Beret. And as usual, we have more than okay guests. You guys asked, I delivered, everybody loves, and everybody loved Star Major Mike Vining the last time we had him on. And he is more than gracious to come back on and, and share uh, a few more insights and give us actually some insight into a... a a really under-told and, and under-shared uh, story and, and how he plays into that. So uh, before we go any further, hey, Star Major, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me back again. I enjoyed it. Um, it go ahead. Yeah. It, it's, it's, always a, it's always a pleasure to, to, to speak with you. Um, you know, this, it's, ju it's July 5th, one day after the greatest day of the year. Um, I think it, it's very telling. To, to really bring on, uh, you know, uh, a, a patriot and, and somebody that, that plays a massive role kind of in the, in the, in the story of America. Uh, last time we had John, we, we talked about your, your service in Vietnam, your service with the unit, and it, we had some incredible insights. We kind of, we even, Star Major, we even blew up uh, a story that had been floating around the, in, on the internet vis-a-vis uh, uh, vis Schwarzkopf PSD. Yeah. <laughs> That's still going around now. I, uh, somebody sent me a copy of that meme with those two couples from St. Louis. Well, that guy with from St. Louis with a, an assault rifle in, inserted into that. I don't know if you've seen it, but they've been. <laughs> I, I have. That. Yep. Oh, that's yeah. too funny. But uh, yeah, that that's that wasn't me. I was doing something different during Desert Storm. You you were doing something a little cooler, honestly. Yeah. Let's face it. And we we had talked about that going after mm -hmm. that after that uh that bunker complex. You're at the Taji Number Two Command and Control Facility. Absolutely, and that that is again. If you guys haven't seen it, I'm going to do a quick plug for the podcast. Go back uh, either if you're watching on YouTube, pull it up on on YouTube, or if you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, whatever. Um, it, the the episode is is very fascinating. We get the Star Major provides uh, incredible insights, especially into that story. It's kind of an underreported story, and and the way that they they ended up solving the problem is right. incredible. It really was. <laughs> but uh, Star Major, I wanted to bring you back on because at the end of the last interview, you had hinted, um, kind of you know towards the end of your career that you you were brought on to do kind of post-blast assessments and, 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 and battle damage assessments uh, for the Cobar Towers attack. So I, I'm, you, you're far more uh, well-read on, on this instance than, than I am. So if, if you don't mind giving us just kind of a quick introduction to the attack, what happened, and then how you kind of played into the whole situation. Okay, well... Uh, this was June 25th, 1996, and it took place at Kobar Towers, Daharan, Saudi Arabia. It was a truck bombing attack against a Air Force housing complex there. And um, this, this bombing took place at about 10 o'clock at night, and a truck pulls in there's two, there's these two huge eight story buildings, building 131 and 133. And um, this is part of a apartment complex that the Saudi government has set up for the Saudis uh, to live in, but the Air Force took it over and put troops in there. So when the truck pulled in, uh, the, the perimeter fence to these two buildings was only 54 feet out. It was some Jersey barriers, some wire, 
not not a significant perimeter, too close to the buildings. The buildings, were, they are apartment complexes, they had a lot of glass. So a sewage truck pulls in into this large parking lot area, which is empty, and these in front of the building, and then these two guys, the guys, the drivers get out and they run into a follow-up vehicle that was behind it, jump in, and then they take off and sp sped out of there. There was two Air Force security people up on top of this eight-story building, saw what was taking place, and um, they started going down to, they went to the eighth floor, they knocked on doors, told them people would get out of the building, get out of the building, they went down to the seventh, and they were at the seventh floor when the bomb detonated. Uh, the bomb killed 19 Air Force personnel. Uh, 18 in the building that was in front of it, and there was another building over that was quite far away that another, the 19th person was killed, and that was from glass shards. The predominantly, the fatal in injuries were all from flying glass, because, uh, and uh, then the building collapsed, the front part of the, the building, and, but the people already were mortally injured from the glass injuries, and then they had the blunt trauma with the concrete and everything. Um, so, very, very tragic. There was, I, I've heard different numbers, 300 to, to even 500 Air Force personnel were injured in this blast, and again, it was predominantly glass. The glass in these buildings did not meet U.S. standards. They weren't tempered glass. They were just ordinary glass, so pretty deadly. So I was, um, they formed, Department of Defense to formed a, an assessment team to go over there to assess what happened, what are the security failures, and how can we upgrade our security in the Middle East? Because a few months before, there was another attack in Riyadh at a um, Sang Saudi Arabia National Guard. A pickup came in there with explosives and some acetylene tanks, and it also killed and wounded several. Per I have a friend who was injured in that attack a few months prior to this attack. So, uh, so anyway, it, General Downing, Wayne Downing, retired at the time. He's since passed away, was put in charge of the investigation. So it's the Downing Assessment Task Force. And I knew General Downing quite well, uh, did a lot of stuff with General Downing. And uh, so he picked me uh, as, as his explosive expert. And we had several other security experts from all, from all different services. It was a Department of Defense investigation. And so I was part of that team that was put together and then we went over here to investigate. At the same time, the FBI was put on to do the criminal investigation of what took place. So immediately when I got over there, I, I worked side by side with the FBI investigators while they were pursuing a criminal case. I was just trying to find out what was this, how was this bomb built, what was it configured with, how much explosives, and then, then we're going to look into the security failures and what we need to upgrade. So at the same time, uh, the Defense Special Weapons Agency set a team over there which was separate from our team. And today, you know, the Defense Special Weapon Agency is known as today as the, threat, as the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. So they were set over there and they did their own thing and stuff. Uh, one of the things that they came up with is that based on their models and the crater that was formed and all their data, you know, and they're used to doing nukes and that kind of stuff. Um, they said that the, there was 20 to 30,000 pounds of explosives in that truck. Uh, we didn't come to the same conclusion. Myself working the numbers and doing, looking at it and doing glass breakage at what distance and what damage. And we have computer uh, programs that you can use to try to calculate how much explosives based on the distance 
uh, like there was a Humvee that was overturned, how much ex uh, pressure would require to overturn a Humvee. And the crater size is significant. And we came to the conclusion that it was really about 3,000 to 5,000 pounds. So there's a big difference between how much explosives was used. And if you look, if you Google this on Wikipedia, there's, I've tried to correct Wikipedia, uh, but they, they go by printed source. And even though I was the lead investigator and I was trying to tell them what took place, I fell on deaf ears with Wikipedia. I just <laughs> caution you users of Wikipedia, you just got to check Wikipedia out and verify things because it's not, some of that stuff is not totally correct. Um, yeah, I just, pulled, the big I just pulled it in up. The crater. Yeah. Well, it's because the, it was a paved, it was paved, but the water table was six foot down. And that has an effect on how the crater is formed. The other thing is that truck with the explosives, that septic tank truck, was filled with sewage, which they did not take into account that the, because when the bomb detonated, all Air Force people that were interviewed and everything said how it stunk. It smelled like a barnyard, you know. So with, the explosives, three to 5,000 pounds, the tank filled up with sewage to disguise if anybody was to stop and check the vehicle out, uh, would just see it's loaded with sewage. But that has a tamping effect where it actually throws the explosive force down. You know, uh, Defense Special Weapons Agency disregarded that tamping effect. They were they're, I guess I'm familiar with how much water can tamp. Initially, when I went to one of their briefings, they said it was insignificant. They later did test, uh, real life tests. But so also the sewage took out a lot of the heat and thermal effect from the explosives that went off. So it was a directional blast down and then what you have when you hit the water table, you have a boundary layer, which affects the crater. You know, it basically, it causes the crater to be wet. So it, the crater, I don't remember at the top of my head, I have it in my notes, the width and length of the crater. So, uh, so anyway, that's to me where the, the biggest difference came from in calculating that they were relying totally on crater width and length and and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we, the buildings, I tell you, they should not have had any personnel living in those buildings. The buildings were not up to code. Uh, you know, they should have done retrofitted those buildings to make up, there was, for example, there was no smoke detectors. There were no, you know, smoke detector, smoke alarms, no fire alarms, no, uh, no emergency lighting. Uh, so when everything, when that went off, everything went black and those who were surviving were floundering around in the dark on their hands and knees on broken glass. Um, so no emergency lighting. There was no designating of a safe area where if there was a threat, where to go in that building. The best place would have been the stairwells uh, because there's no windows in the stairwells to immediately move to the stairwell. And then when you're told to move out into an area, uh, you know, to, but there was just a lot of things wrong. And th they have been under surveillance and probed. And when you look at this, things. There was different test runs of their security. They were being watched. The, you know, you had that other explosion that happened a few months prior. It didn't appear to us that they took this threat, these threats seriously. And it also appeared to us, and I'm going to be hard on, on the Air Force on this one, but they, their quality of life seemed to overrule security, whereas security interfered with quality of life, quality of life won out. My saying is, 
what is quality of life if you're in the ground six foot deep? Um, so the Air Force said that they, they asked the Saudis to expand the, the perimeter fence um, and Saudis refused. So we said, okay. So we interviewed the Saudis. The Saudis said, no, nobody asked us to, Nate wanted the security fence to be extended. If they did, we would have approved it. The Air Force didn't have any documentations to prove their point that they had requested that. So who do you believe? The fence wasn't extended. Uh, well, the other thing is, they only put two people to a room in a bunch of buildings. There was other buildings that were housed, people were housed, they were away from, farther away from the perimeter. Um, but they only put two people to a room and the rooms could easily handle six people to a room. But again, it was, they figured quality of life. Those two buildings should not have been used for housing, you know. Maybe you could use them for day use or office use for the daytime. Um, but anyway, that's what it, and also there was, um, you have laminate film that you can put on these windows. You can retrofit the blast resistant windows. So you put this laminate film on the windows and uh, so it keeps the glass shard, it's adhesive. It, so it prevents the, you have a whole broken piece of, it's kind of like tempered glass, you know, uh, like your front windshield of your car. Um, that was talked about, I guess that was in the budget, but it wasn't deemed a priority to put this blast resistant mylar film on the windows. Uh, so anyway, our report was very critical of the Air Force in that. Now, the Air Force commander of the installation was a brigadier general, and he was up for a second star. And um, so the Air Force, after all this, was, and we were very critical, he was still going to get his second star. The Air Force was still putting him on in for a second star. Well, Department of Defense, uh, Congress said no way. So he actually, if you look it up, took it to the Supreme Court to get a second start, U.S. Supreme Court for a second start. Really? Supreme Court denied it. I don't know if they reviewed it. I think they looked at it and said, we ain't gonna do it. And so he never got a second star. I, I, I you know, and again, I might be critical, but I believe if that was a Marine general or a Army general, that would have been a career ending, uh, assignment um, so but that was it and then after that was over with after we filed our report and stuff like that we went around the Middle East looking at the, the different housing areas where military is housed in the Middle East and also State Department personnel where they're housed to make on-the-spot uh, improvements to security you know, recommending different things, designating a safe area in your facility, wherever you are, to go to if there's a threat, uh, and um, and just initial security improvements in the Middle East to upgrade that and make everybody aware. So I did that. That took about six months to the whole thing. Anyway, I guess the perpetrators were Saudis, Saudi nationals. You know, it's no, no big surprise. 9-11 terrorists were mostly Saudis. Osama bin Laden's a Saudi. Yeah, there's a lot of Saudi nationals that are dissatisfied with the monarchy. And, and um, so, well, so... Anyway, the Saudi government rounded the perpetrators up and executed them before the FBI could talk to anybody. So that's wow. how that one ended. <laughs> I mean, it's not in the realm of disbelief to believe that the Saudis just 
would round somebody up and, and execute them. Um, even if it, you know, especially if it meant saving face and, and if they viewed it as a, as a affront to their cooperation and with the United States government, they don't want to jeopardize anything like that. But I mean, going back, you said, kind of circling back, you said that there were, there were two Air Force personnel on the roof. Yes. I, it, it was so they what they were they were security i mean were security, they Air Force okay, security so it, it was like it was like an op like yes it was so i mean the the question that's i mean were they like again this is a totally undertold story in, in american history I, were they armed i mean was it was it an actual you know security point i mean was there uh was there a two it was more there? like an observation point i okay. do not know what weapons they were carrying at, but they had a, a you know they were had radios uh, but it was a shame that, that there was no way to set off for them to set off an alarm to they had a some type of siren thing set up there that they could initiate and tell everybody to evacuate um just going down knocking on door to door is not a good plan no and, and it just <sighs> I mean, you, ha you know, part of me says, hey, it's 1996, right? Like, is like Islamic terror isn't really on, on everybody's forefront right now. But at the same time, you know, three years prior, they, they took their first shot at the World Trade Center. And mm -hmm. they've yeah. been seeing, you know, late 80s, early 90s, kind of the rise of Islamic terrorism. And then you, you mentioned just months prior, there was a, an attack in Riyadh. Right. Um, it was at a, it was, at a Saudi Arabia National Guard, it was a military advisor compound, uh, U.S. military, that uh, they put a, pulled a pickup up and set off a bomb right next to the building. So, I mean, with that, I mean, why, why wasn't, I mean, I guess the, I don't know what the ROE was at the time, but, you know, a, a truck pulls up, parks right outside the perimeter fence, which is only 54 feet away from the main housing building i mean that it that just seems like weird like you see two guys and, and these the the security personnel obviously knew something was up because they saw this and they started knocking on doors to get people mm -hmm. to evacuate I and mean, it's just it's just like and maybe it goes off of what you said you know this you know quality of life over overruled you know you know, for, you know, force protection because mm -hmm. of that. But that just seems, it seems like a massive, massive failure in saying, hey, listen, we're in the Middle East. It, it, is Saudi Arabia an ally? Yes. Is it really a permissive environment? That's, I don't think, I don't, at least, you know, I don't think Saudi Arabia is a permissive environment. You see a truck pull up to the edge of the security perimeter and then the guy's, hightail it out um that seems strange to me it, it yeah i agree with you nick i you know i would pull up categories as set what we call semi-permissive environment where there is a group in saudi arabia that's dissatisfied with the government and would like to overthrow the government so and one way is the americans to you know, to make it a national, international event is to do these attacks against the Americans that are being hosted by the Saudi government. Yeah, it's, it's a shame. And yeah, it was, it was a shame. It was 19 dead and 300 to 500 injured. So what um, was, I mean, the other, the other massive question that, that arises is, now, I'm not a I'm not a bomb expert. I'm not. Um, but you know, if you have if you have a bunch of if you have a subject matter expert come in and say, "Hey, you know the the liquid, the water in this truck, which acted as a tamper. You had the the the, uh, the water table, the water table at at six feet acting. I mean, why? And and like you said, like if you know the, the the information that comes out of it, it says, oh, it was initially. I, I just looked up at the Wikipedia. It said initially, it was believed to be three to five thousand pounds. Your assessment? That that was, and that's my, our final assessment. FBI and my assessment were, 
you, know, you can't really pin it down, say it was 4,320 pounds, but it's in that ballpark. It's not really important in the long run, but you know, 20 to 30,000 pounds is a lot of explosives. And the explosive was composition C4. Really? Yeah, it wasn't ammonia nitrate. It wasn't uh, in, in fuel oil. It was, and from my information is, it was American, American composition C4. That's a whole nother can of worms. Yeah. And how do you know American C4 from other kinds of C, you know, composition C4 plastic explosives is one of the things that when we make our C4, uh, it's mostly RDX based, but in the process of making RDX explosives, you also, a byproduct is HMX explosives. HMX is a little bit more powerful explosives than RDX. So other countries that manufacture, say, composition C4, they remove the HMX out of the RDX because they want it for using it in weapon, this HMX and different weapon systems. It's more powerful explosives. HMX is more expensive to make than RDX. So, but we don't care. So we have just, we have a little bit of traces of RDX in, I mean, HMX in our composition C4. So it has a different chemical signature when you're looking at the residue of the explosives and the FBI, I didn't do any of that anal laboratory analysis the FBI did. So did I was lead, told- Did that lead anywhere? Like, oh, this, we have, this is, um, this American made C4. This isn't, this isn't Semtex. This isn't Soviet grade stuff. This isn't, this isn't homemade stuff. This is American. And, and I mean, it that, the source could have come even from Afghanistan. The, um, the, the, the explosives could have been brought in from Afghanistan because, you know, from 1979 to 1989, uh, the Russians had occupied Afghanistan, and we were supporting the opposition force uh, with weapons and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So, it, you know, even Stinger missiles and stuff like that. And it, it could have came that route. I don't know exactly where it, the explosives came from. And I don't know if you ever knew. And of course, the FBI never had a chance to in interrogate the perpetrators because the they were executed. So everything became silent, quiet. I mean, that's just, I don't know. that <laughs> the, I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, but that, 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 that stinks. You know, yeah. we know because the, the Saudis are a close partner. The Saudi government, I should say, is a close partner of the United States. And it wouldn't be the first time that that somebody within the Saudi government turned on the United States and, and things right. like that. So again, now I'm not surprised. They just flat out executed them before any questions could be asked because that might've, that might've led to a, a very difficult line of questioning in, in mm -hmm. terms of where they. they Source of the explosives that. came exactly. from. Yeah. And we don't know how the whether they used uh, it was time fuse or it was um, they used a time fuse delay. We don't know that. Uh, we don't know if they used chemical delay pencils. So we really didn't know how it was set up to function. That's again, that's crazy to me. You know, is I, I mean, but. I, I just, I still can't, I still can't, it, I know you said it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things of, oh, how much explosive was used or things like that, but just the disparity in, in terms of, all right, we have an entire government agency dedicated to finding these things out, and because those things play long term, you know, well, in, in terms of establishing pattern, and I'm not going to get into details of, of how organizations operate, but 
those things do play into, you know, oh, how much explosives are they using? How right. much do they get their hands on? And, and, and in terms of preparing for future attacks. And those I things do kind you. of play into, in, come into play. Yeah, they do in future attacks. The Air Force really liked the twenty to 30,000 pound number. The Air Force liked that number because what can you do against 20 to 30,000 pounds? So they're saying we couldn't, we couldn't do nothing against that. That's just so massive amount. How do you protect against that? We would have had to have that fence way out, you know, uh, where? And um, so the Air Force did like that number. Um, but it, I don't think that that was the reality. And um, and just because you say that uh, the it, the number's way out there, that you can't do any type of protection against that, you know, it's not never going. You know, that's just crazy to have twenty to thirty thousand pounds of explosives. Yeah, that that I mean, I mean, can a truck even handle carrying that much it, weight? It could. The sewage truck could. I I did the math on it, and it 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 did, and it had the volume, the capacity, to do that. Uh, so I I worked the math out on it, and yes, it, theoretically that, but it had been packed full. But that would be you would have to totally disregard all the other factors that you had mentioned, right? In order for that to be true. Yeah. Man, that's that's. That's wild to me. It really is. It it really is. Um, but three three to five thousand seems it. That seems reasonable. It, it, does. it does. That's that's okay. Hey, you can absolutely get your hands on that much explosive. You can absolutely take it to the edge, especially if security is not the main concern. Fifty four feet for an outer perimeter is nothing. No, it's it, it, yeah, it's nothing. Um, and. It, especially you you said it was just jersey barriers and like concertina it, it wasn't they weren't blast walls they it was no. i don't know maybe it was maybe it was just a different time in 1996 i was six years old in 1996 um maybe it was just a different time but nowadays that just at least looking through the lens of what we know today mm -hmm. that just seems highly irresponsible yeah, yeah. We the downing the downing assessment task force was very became out very critical. There there was the Air Force had done their security teams. The Air Force had sent in to look at their security. They made a lot of security recommendations, like the Mylar film and stuff. So all these recommendations were there was done, but nothing was done to react on all that you know to to do fulfill these recommend security recommendations that were requested uh so i mean it wasn't done this wasn't in a vacuum people knew so they had the assessments they uh, they had the threats they knew that they were under surveillance and there was different other suspicious vehicle activity that had, like probing the security and seeing how the security would react so those were all clues that uh, something could be possibly in the works and but it was nothing just a failure they could have moved those people out of that those two buildings easily that that's a shame and and you know, as we've already said now you know not now but then 19 US airmen were were KIA in a in a mm -hmm. terror incident <sighs> that just i don't know it just I don't know. That's multiple points of failure for sure. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's multiple points of failure. Um, I, I guess in the in the long term, I mean, did 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 the United States Air Force learn its lesson? Huh. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I you know there was a, I, I can't say that there's since that time there was anything that was of that magnitude you know, lapse in security and force protection, like you say, against it. You know, we, we had different, there's been different attacks like the USS Cole, you know, uh, attack. You know, that, that should, in my opinion, that USS Cole attack, they shouldn't have allowed that boat to get anywhere near in an American ship. Um, 
and from my information, I didn't, I wasn't involved in that and in investigation of that, but I've been told that it was a, like a giant platter charge that they, they set off against the coal. Of that. I mean, is that, so, does that take complexity? Does that take serious know-how? Yeah. Of some sort of, you know, you think it's some sort of state sponsored, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, you know, EFPs, the, explo the explosive flying plates, um, the, um, you know, the Iranians are well into doing the EFP technology, which was used in Iraq um, against American troops. Uh, so, you know, we have weapons that use the EFP technology, like the Hellfire missile uses EFP technology and uses what you call dual platter charges. One platter charge behind the other platter charge. They, like the, uh, I think the improved hoe had platter charges. I mean, I, I we, I, I, I spoke with, with Joe Kent on this podcast about uh, EFPs. I, I actually, we had jo I had Joe on the show um, the, the day that Suleimani was killed. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just coincidence. Um, but, you know, Joe was a guy that cut his teeth at, at the height of Iraq and was very familiar with, with the EFP threat and things like that. So I, I think that's telling. I mean, something like that. Yeah, that requires know-how. That you know, we know that the EFP threat was came from a state sponsor. Um, we, you know, because you you need that know-how. That's not something that that a bunch of guys with fourth grade educations can put together. Um, that you, somebody needs to be pulling the strings. So and that's why I ask. Like, okay, you know, to pull off something like this, to, to get the source of the the explosives. I mean, is there is there something more to that? And uh, honestly, we'll we'll never know because, like you said, the the Saudis rounded those guys up and summarily executed them. And, I'm and sure the Saudis the got the information before they were executed. Oh, we'll guaranteed, got... <laughs> guaranteed, they did. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I don't, I doubt they'd be willing to share or ever will. Um, mm -hmm. so that's just the way it is. But. I, that was that, it's some fascinating insights, like I said, to, to a, a very, uh, you know, kind of an overlooked story um, in, in American military history, especially with, with the foray and, and the lead up to the global war on terror and things like that. But, yeah. you know, and, and honestly, I appreciate you, you sitting down and sharing that insight because that it's, it, it's fascinating and nobody, nobody's, nobody's, Nobody hears about that. And yeah, you can pull up the Wikipedia, but like you said, it's based off of a uh, reporting that might be skewered or false. So or misinterpreted. Exactly. So, you know, hear, hearing that, hearing that is, it's important. Right. Uh, so, and, and that's, again, at least in terms of your career, that's kind of a, an interesting anecdote. Like nobody would think, oh, you know, Sergeant Major Vining going to do a post blast assessment on the Cobar Towers. Um, yeah. that's, that's something very few people would realize. Yeah, you know, the TWA 800 incident off New York when TWA 800 went down, uh, there was a lot of speculations on what brought down TWA 800. And um, the one of the conspiracy theories was a missile being fired from a Navy vessel. I do you remember all that, Nick? Uh, uh, briefly. I've, I've, I've read the theories, yes. Yeah. Well, so the FBI was doing the criminal investigation, if there was a criminal investigation to be done in TWA 800. And, of course, the National Transportation Safety Board did their own investigation in case it was some kind of accident. Uh, and, um, but the FBI didn't come up with any criminal, uh, criminal activity that may have brought the TWA 800, but they, so they brought me in to, to look at it, to make sure that it was not done by, through sabotage in a manner that they were not aware of, you know, uh, so I, I had a friend 
and he owned two 747s. So, and I went out to my friend and I says to him, I asked him, teach me everything you know about the fuel system of a 747. So we got the books out, went through the fuel system of 747, went out to his 747, went out oh, the process of how you fuel the set to introduce anything of sabotage into the fuel system. That's what I was trying to gain. So I then went up and I looked at what uh, they had and stuff like that. So, and, and I, we did not come up with anything form of sabotage, how to enter something into the fuel tank of a 747. Because it was the, there was no doubt, it was the number one main fuel tank that was uh, between where the cargo compartment is, a car hole, and where the landing gear is, the center fuel tank is located there. Then on a 747, you have, you have uh, fuel tanks on the wings. Uh, there's like two, two main fuel tanks on each wing. And then there's auxiliary fuel tanks further out on, on the wings. So, and you can, uh, so when you, you can gravity fuel 747. Now most, when they refuel 747, say it's pressure filled, they hook up a hose to it and they just do it. But if you had to, if you didn't have any way to pressure fill it, you can gravity. The gravity fuel mechanism where you can open up on top of the wing and actually get into the fuel tank, uh, the wing tanks, you could probably introduce something to that. But the fuel tank that actually blew up and you can tell the way the metal expanded out where there was an internal fuel tank that um, there was a plate that you'd have to go into the cargo compartment, remove this plate, all these bolts, and to get in there to do an inspection of the tank and stuff like that and put it back. It, nothing that nobody would do and it was not like somebody put something external to the tank on the tank to blow it inwards and you'd have metal going inwards. So what happened was they were on the tarmac for a long period of time and they emptied that fuel tank. They have a, they run the pump and then there's a scavenger pump that removes all the fuel out of the fuel tanks. So they just moved the fuel out of that and put it into the wing tanks. So that basically that tank that blew up was empty, but it still had probably a little bit of fuel, had vapor in it and stuff. Underneath that fuel tank is an air conditioning unit, um, which air conditioning, and so sitting on the ground, it was hot, the air conditioning unit was running, so it produces vapor, you know, it's just heat and vapor. Uh, so, so it was an ignition source inside of that tank. And I, in my looking at it and reading and, and what I learned on that, I believe the ignition source to that disaster was the a scavenger pump. There's some therm, so with the pilot flips on the switch, turns on the scavenger to get all the fuel out. If it overheats, scavenger, there's a thermal switch, there's three of them I think, that will shut the, shut the electricity off to that. But I think that it over, somehow they failed and they overheated and the ignition source was the scavenger pump. Totally different than the National Transportation Safety Board. Really? Their, fin their final report is that uh, you have a, it was a, it was a bundle, uh, you have a wiring harness and it was possibly a wear on the wiring harness, abrasion and over time. So there's a low voltage sensor, fuel sensor that goes into the tank and to register the fuel, you know, whether, how capacity of the tank. They believe that it was a, some type of wear where a high voltage line crossed over into the low voltage line of the sensor and the spark came from the pressure gauge sensor. Now, they, the, pre, they, the uh, scavenger pump was never recovered. When they recovered all the pieces, so you can't analyze that. Um, so they believe that was the source of, of it. 
Uh, so who knows? But I, I wonder why we do not have systems that are built into these commercial aircraft that you can introduce to, when a tank is empty like that, you introduce an inert gas like nitrogen uh, so that you cannot, if ignition source would not do anything uh, in a nitrogen induced environment, there would be no oxygen to have a, an ignition. Now, on all of our fighter aircraft or tactical aircraft and stuff, we have such a system to prevent, you know, a fuel tank explosions. It would be very easy to these manufacturers of, of airlines to include a system with inert gas, nitrogen being one of them, but it will take, it, it requires more maintenance. It, it adds weight to the aircraft, which maybe reduces its capacity, but uh, there has been other incidents in the past where fuel tank explosions if you look at history of aviation accidents and stuff like that. And I, I, would, I, I would feel much safer if we had a nitrogen system on our fuel tanks that we just infuse the tanks with this inert gas. I, were, you, were you brought on officially for, to, into that investigate? Okay, so you The were. FBI brought me in to just to, to it, they were concerned about, they didn't come up with any, way of sabotage could have caused that, but they didn't want to overlook anything. So I was asked to go up there and to see if the, you could do something with through the sabotage uh, to to do that. And uh, yeah, I and and there is possibility of doing it, but you couldn't it would have been hard for that tank to introduce something into that tank. Yeah, and, and from what I know about TWA 800 was, so it seems like you and the official findings agree that, okay, it was the, the vapors in the empty tank that, that allowed, it was just the ignition that, that you believe, you, you believe it came from the, the heat scavenger and, pump. And, and from, the, from the scavenger pump, and then the official findings were, what, faulty wiring. Right, a wiring abrasion, uh, crossing a high voltage line, crossing into a low voltage right line, particularly the fuel sensor line. Um, but uh, they did test. They did test on that. I don't think they honestly could have. They honestly, and I don't know, reproduced a successful result based on their study. But that's, if you look at the cause, that's what they determine the cause to be. Interesting. But neither, you know, you know, I don't know what you do to prevent that. You're going to have to re, uh, re, you sep keep the line separate in any high voltage line, separate from a low voltage line, and they're being their own bundle, wiring harness and bundles, not mix them together. Man. I, again, uh, I, I don't know if the airline industry is going to do anything that might cut into their bottom line, but mm -hmm. um, fascinating nonetheless. And fast, and and again, fascinating that they brought you in to see, hey, is this something that we that could have been sabotaged? Is it something like that? Because, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm familiar with the conspiracy theories that it, you know, all right, the United States naval warship <laughs> shot down a team. Me personally, listen. I know the way the military works, and I'm pretty sure a a surface-to-air missile is 100 percent on somebody's property book. <laughs> yeah, and, and also, how do you keep a whole shipload of sailors quiet? What what happened was eyewitnesses saw fire. You know, when it exploded, it rained down, burning fuel fell out of the sky. But to some of those witnesses, it was a trick. And they imagine that the flames were going upward, you know, and so it's kind of, I don't know whether it's an optical illusion or what. So they thought that the flames going upward would have been the exhaust from a missile. So, you know, it's eyewitnesses, you know, unless they're an expert eyewitness, that a lot of eyewitness testimony, 
is really not very accurate. And, you know, you can, in a lot of you can see a lot of criminal cases that we've had in the past where all there was was eyewitness, nothing else but eyewitness testimony. And then later on through DNA and, you know, new technology, the person's innocent. He's been spent 20, 30 years in jail based on an eyewitness. Eyewitnesses are terrible. Unless, unless it's an aviation expert that's watching it or somebody that's more trained in that and familiar with that, then regular and ordinary eyewitnesses, totally unreliable. Man, well, wh- I mean, honestly, it's some insights into Cobar Tower and insights into TWA 800, which again, it, you know, it, it's on there. Yeah, I come across the YouTube videos, the conspiracy theories mm-hmm. that, that kind of generate from that. Um, but you're right, it all kind of stems from those eyewitness accounts. How do you keep a ship full of people quiet? The la- I mean, the last time yeah, the United yeah, States, no. you can't. And again, you know, surface air missiles are definitely on a property book, <laughs> and you know, it's it's like, oh, you can't you can't feel loss a, a, a missile. You can't. Right. But right. I mean, that's fascinating, especially since you know the last time you know the United States naval warship accidentally shot down a passenger liner. Right. The USS Vinson. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they, they there was really no hiding it. I mean, there was no, definitely you, an investigation and, into it and why they shot down a seven forty seven. Um, but but just recently, you had the Iranians shoot down the passenger airline. When I saw that video, it was clear to me that it was a missile that brought the. I could see the video, I, it, and they were still denying it. But that video did not lie. And it was clearly, and then when you see the damage and the frag holes that are peppered uh, in the fuselage, uh, there was none of that in the TWA 100. Uh, You know, people love conspiracy theories. There's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there. And I don't know, just people love a good conspiracy, but uh, there's very few conspiracies. You can't keep a lot of that stuff quiet. No, you you can't. But you're right. I mean, yeah, the Iranians, the uh, the Malaysian airline that was that was brought down by the uh, by the Russians and over Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty clear how those how those missiles work. Yeah, it's an easy investigation to determine cause. That's fascinating, though, and fascinating that they brought you in to see if hey, because they didn't think it was a shoot down. They thought somebody had tampered right with the fuel system. Right, it was clearly not a missile took it down, but they wanted to see, they just, the FBI just wanted to cover its bases, made through, they did a good check to see if there was not a criminal element that brought the airline down and put it into it. And clearly it was an accident. Man, well, sorry, Major, I don't want to take up any more of this beautiful Sunday from you, but as always, I want to thank you because your insights are one highly interesting Two, they're totally out of left field in the sense that you can't really pick up a book and, and get the inside scoop of, of Cobar or, or TWA 800 or things like that. Um, and to hear, and to hear it kind of from the horse's mouth to be like, Hey, I was there, you know, here, here are my bona fides, which again, you know, from the last episode, guys, if you haven't listened, you have to. Uh, we didn't really go over Star Major's history uh, in, in this episode, but his time as, as an EOD, his time as an operator, uh, and then how he really combined those two skill sets. And that it kind of – that really pushed your career, the fact that you yeah. had hands in both pies. Well, I went to JSOC in 1992. I was in JSOC from 1992 to 1999. I was a sil- still assigned to Delta, but for duty at JSOC. And I worked exercise branch from 92 to 96, running joint readiness exercise, quarterly exercises. I was a sergeant major that. Then from 96 to 99, I was the J3 special plan sergeant major. And my job was target defeat of hardened targets. So that's how I got involved in that. And I worked with Defense Special Weapons Agency at the time, now Defense Threat Reduction Agency, went all over the US and foreign countries, looking at facilities 
like underground facilities, different other hardened facilities, looking for vulnerabilities uh, and recommending, rec uh, making recommendations to looking for single point vulnerabilities that would have the most impact on the facility, identifying them, and so that they put in safeguards. Uh, I, I look, I've been to the, bomb, the two bomb shelters at the White House. They were worried if there was a large explosion and the doors jammed, how would we get the people out of the White House? Well, I had to come, came up with plans to do that. And uh, so I would go around the country and doing these, whether it be a disgruntled employee, a terrorist attack, a natural disaster, uh, and look at and make these all these recommendations on different facilities. And went to Norway, looked at a couple of facilities in Norway. Um, and uh, so I, that's how I ended my career. What, and God, what a career. Um, I mean, guys, if you guys are listening to this and you haven't listened to the first episode, uh, Sergeant Major takes us through, to, through Vietnam, through Desert One, through, uh, you know, through Grenada, and, and it is, it is a, it's a roller coaster. It really is. It is a roller coaster of a career, and it's, it is 100% just, it's something that, that Hollywood couldn't come up with. And just from, just from that, from the, from the stories of combat, from the stories of failed rescue, rescue missions, from the stories of blowing the biggest explosive caches in, in the Vietnam War, and then capping it off with, you know, doing assessments for the, the most secure spots, you know, in, in CONUS. So, what a career, guys. If you didn't listen to the first episode, I highly recommend you go back and listen through. Sar Major, I can't thank you enough. It, as always, it is an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to listen to what you have to say. Thanks, Nick. It's been my pleasure and looking forward to talking to you again. Absolutely. Hey, thanks, Sar Major. Real quick, guys, if uh, you guys – you guys know I'm off Twitter. Um, I'm, 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 I'm done with Twitter for the time. But if you want to support the podcast, check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash NickGuy. allows me to keep doing this. Hopefully once COVID ends, we can do some actual sit-down interviews, especially with the real old-timers, a couple Korean War vets, and some of the older Vietnam vets I really want to, I really want to speak to who aren't technically savvy or they don't have family members who can assist them. Um, once COVID is over, hopefully we can, we can facilitate some sit down interviews here and share those stories. Cause they're very important. Um, as usual, if you guys are watching on YouTube, please like subscribe and share. Uh, it helps, uh, helps the algorithm and, and getting my stuff on people's front page. And so our unsuspecting victims can stumble upon, uh, these stories that I think all Americans should be hearing. You guys are listening on any sort of podcast platform please rate it it, it helps so once again sorry major it's always a pleasure thanks nick all right be well sorry major bye